Any worshipers in the building today? Come on. Any worshipers? Come on. I know you're a pastor, but are you a worshiper? I know you lead a church, but are you a worshiper? Come on. I know you got responsibilities, but can we just remember the fact that I'm a worshiper before I'm anything else? It's funny. There's a comparison biblically between two leaders, Saul and David. I think we're all familiar with the comparison between Saul and David. There's this moment in 1 Samuel 15 where Saul loses the kingdom. He reaches out to tear the cloth, the garment for Samuel, and he says these words, don't take the kingdom from me. And then Psalm 51, David is confronted by the prophet Nathan. You see, both of these men have sinned. They've fallen short, they've disobeyed, but David's words are not, don't take the kingdom from me. David's words are, don't take your spirit from me. Because before I'm the king, I'm a worshiper. Before I'm a preacher, I'm a worshiper. Before I'm an orator, I'm a worshiper. Before I'm the leader of the organization, I'm a worshiper. Before I'm the CEO, I'm a worshiper. Before I'm the children's ministry director, I'm a worshiper. And God, my cry today is don't take your spirit from me. God, thank you that your presence is in the room. God, thank you that you've chosen me. God, thank you that you walk with me. God, thank you that your hand is on my life. God, thank you that when nobody else would have taken a chance on me, you took a chance on me and you recruited me into the ministry. God, thank you. I'm a worshiper. How many worshipers we got in the room? God, restore the joy of ministry. God, restore the joy of being in your presence. God, we love you. And we give this session over to you. And God, whatever you got to do in our hearts, do it. This heaviness you got to lift, lift it. The curse you got to break on the ground, break it. And God, we dedicate this next 30 minutes to you. God, speak to my soul. I don't want to be a leader like Saul. I want to be a leader like David. Maybe this is the reason that God says, oh, this dude, he's after my own heart. He's not after the title or the accolade or the position. Because in the moment where he was going to lose it all, the thing that he was concerned about losing was, God, just don't take your spirit from me. You can take everything else. But the thing that got me here was the fact that I had a relationship with you. And what good is the ministry if I lose my relationship with you? What good is the platform if I can't hear your voice anymore? What good is it? What good is a big church if, if me and you don't have the kind of communion that we used to have? God, don't take your spirit from me. So God, we ask that your spirit would fall in the room. God, we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you to change the culture. God, we need you to bring revival. God, we need a fresh wind of the Holy Ghost to blow through our churches. God, we need you. We need you to bring restoration. So God, I ask that in the next 30 minutes you would anoint me, that you would anoint this room. God, I've got a sermon, but you've got a message. So God, I ask that you would speak clearly today to every pastor, to every leader, to every volunteer, to every pastor's wife, to every youth pastor, to whoever's in the room and needs to hear the word. God, I ask that you would open their ears, that you would open their eyes, and that, Lord God, that hard hearts, crushed hearts, will become soft and circumcised. God, we thank you in advance for everything you're going to say and do. Come on, in Jesus' name we pray. We all said together, amen. Amen, amen, amen. You can high five your neighbor. Tell them they look good even if they don't. As we speak those things that be not as though they were. You tell people they look good, they'll start looking good. Anybody love Pastor Kevin and Pastor Sheila? Thank you so much for inviting me into your world. Thank you. Um, uh, you have now been recruited uh, to be a mentor and coach into my life. And uh, I, may, I uh, intended to make that moment public so that you couldn't say no. 
Uh, and so thank you, uh, seriously, for all the warm hospitality. Thank you. Um, yesterday was incredible. And um, I, I uh, kept pinching myself, like, I, I get to speak at this event, but man, I've gotten more out of yesterday um, than anything that I will probably give today. And so we love you. We honor you. Thank you guys so much for leading uh, and being an example of integrity and vision and wisdom and kingdom principles. We love you so much. Um, come on, if you got a Bible, go ahead, grab a Bible. Uh, grab a Bible. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. And I like to read fill-in-the-blank style, okay? I like to read fill-in-the-blank style. And uh, there's a reason that I'm super, super excited about Teen Church Conference. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is that um, I'm a big church guy. I love church, okay? I love the church. If anybody's never heard me before, or maybe this is your first time hearing me speak, uh, we're going to get close real fast. I'm going to be transparent and honest and vulnerable. Um, I come from a very, very dysfunctional home background. Uh, my dad was incarcerated for 18 years. Uh, he's a Cuban immigrant, came to this country literally with nothing after being incarcerated in Cuba for 18 years. Uh, my dad met up with his family who was here in the States and they were drug uh, affiliated and my dad started to sell drugs and then use drugs. My dad took me to a crack house for the first time when I was five years old. My mom was pregnant at the age of 12 with my oldest sister, pregnant again at 14 with my older brother. Uh, everything that I saw growing up was broken and dysfunctional. Uh, three of my aunts, prostitutes, most of my uncles are alcoholics. Uh, 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 poverty and dysfunction and brokenness and, and the curse of just a wicked life was everything that I knew. And then my mama took me to a church when I was 11 years old, a church. I'm the first Orango with a bachelor's degree. I'm the first Orango to get my doctorate. I'm the first Orango to own property. I'm the first Orango to sign the front of checks, not the back of checks. I'm the first Orango to have kids after marriage, not before marriage. I'm the first Orango to be in ministry. I'm the first Orango to be a pastor, to preach this gospel. I'm the first Orango to walk in victory. And the best part is I won't be the last. Oh, baby, everything coming after me is going to be free. Everything coming after me is going to walk in healing and deliverance. And, and, I, and I love telling my story uh, because a generational curse only has power if you believe in it. God's invitation to you is the same invitation he gives to Nicodemus. You can be born again. You was born to a crackhead and a teenage mama, but guess what? You can be born again. You can be born again. You was born the wrong way, you can be born again. You was born into some sin, you can be born again. Uh, my gospel is the same gospel to every sector of society, you can be born again. You thought you was born with something that's, you know, is setting you back, okay, cool. You need to be born again, I need to be born again. We all need to be born again. Uh, and so, uh, but my mom took me to church. Church. Uncle Stephen Irvin taught me how to drive. Because my dad couldn't. My youth pastor is the person I started giving my report cards to and my progress reports to. My youth pastor took me to Tuxedo shopping for the prom. Uncle Joey's the first person that taught me how to budget my money and get my finances in order because my parents couldn't teach me that. Jesus saved me, but the church raised me. What we do matters. What we do in church has eternal weight to it. Church, church, church. If I say church, church. First place I saw air freshener. Church. Tell that to your volunteer who's sick and tired of doing stuff that's detail oriented. First room I walked in where people had to show up on time, church. First place I walked in that was excellent and organized, church. First, part, my dad took me to a crack house when I was five years old. The very first environment that was neat and orderly and organized. The first place where I had to call somebody by a title, church. First place where volunteers weren't allowed to look raggedy, but they had to like wear something, church. What we do, you think the church's job is not to cater to the dysfunction. The church's job is to be the braces for your crooked teeth. That's the church's job. 
The church's job is not to cater to all of the chaos that is in somebody's life. The church's job is to say, this is order, this is function, and now we're gonna bring healing into your life because we don't bend to you, you will bend to what we are doing by bringing the kingdom of God to bear in the earth. So I don't care what you do in church, we honor you. You're creating environments where the ground can be healed. The ground I was born into was crushed and was cursed, but man, I got into some new soil. And so I don't care what you do, you park cars, you're a part of helping people transform their life. You take care of children in children's church, you're a part of helping people transform their life. You preach from the stage, you're, you're a part of helping people transform their life. I need a good amen in church today. Come on, let's go to Matthew chapter 14. Now, here we go. We're about to make an agreement because um, I'm black. I don't know if you noticed that at all. You know, I'm black. Every, every buff, every day, all the time. Um, can't stop it, you know? Um, and so we're going to make an, an, an agreement because the church I grew up at, okay, um, ain't no mistake or there's no ambiguity or confusion whether or not you're doing a good job or a bad job at a black church. There's no, like... You never get off stage like, I wonder if that was good. Never, you know, never, okay? Um, if you're doing a bad job, if you're doing a bad job, one of the church mamas will stand up in the middle of your sermon. Now, a bad job means your jokes ain't funny. A bad job means you're stretching the text. Now, church mama ain't never been to seminary, but she know when she hear heresy, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> church mama's like, mm, that ain't in the book, son. Get back to the book, get back to the book, okay? If you're doing a bad job at a black church, a black church mama will just stand up and go, help him, Holy Ghost. <laughs> to which you're not even mad at that. You know, as a preacher, you're like, I know she ain't lying. Holy Ghost, please honor her prayer. I know this is bad, she knows it's bad. Holy Ghost, please help me do something. But if you're preaching good at a black church, if you're preaching good, a black church mama will begin to shout, begin to say stuff like, boy, you better preach. Let's go. Say it again for the folks in the back. Make it plain. Uh, and my favorite thing that a black church mom will say is this. Take your time, preacher. Take your time. So here we go. We're going to make an agreement. We're going to make an agreement, okay? You are going to promise to give me all your black energy today. I dub thee black, okay? But it ain't normal black. This is like Cinderella black. It's gone at midnight, okay? You're not black tomorrow. I'm just... It's just for today, okay? So, if there's anything you ever wanted to do, today's your day, okay? So, if you wanted to dunk on somebody, like today. Today's your day. So, uh, here we go, but we're gonna make an agreement. Here we go. Because there was no timer at the church I started preaching at. So, you give me all your black energy, I'll give you all this white timeliness. That's our agreement, okay? I will end on time as long as you act excited, okay? That's our agreement. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to do a little fill in the blank style. If there's a word that I don't say, you're going to say the word that I don't say. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, we're going to start reading in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the and go on ahead of him to the other while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up to a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking. No big deal. It's just Jesus walking on water, okay? When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were so excited because they got to witness a miracle. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they praised God because they ain't never seen nothing like this. No, no, no. They were. Isn't it crazy how you could be on the precipice of a miracle? And instead of being excited about all the new things God is doing, you could actually be terrified by what God is doing because God doesn't ask for your permission to do something uncomfortable or unpredictable or new. God just shows up and goes, all right, we about to get you out of your comfort zone. And you could be on the verge of a miracle in your church and instead of you feeling excited, the control freak in you is terrified. Come on, we just read the Bible. It's a ghost, they said. 
And they cried out in fear. I, I love this uh, because Jesus then says, take courage. Stop complaining about the people who discouraged you. Stop waiting for people to encourage you. Your courage is your responsibility. If you're going to have it, you're going to have to take it. Take courage. I, I love this. I love this. Lord, if it's tell to come to on the water. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting moment, okay? So, so the guys are in the boat, you know. Is that Jesus? I don't know. I don't think that's Jesus. I think that's a ghost. Judas, shut up. <laughs> Judas and Thomas, y'all just stop talking, okay? I think that's Jesus. And, you know, all the characters of the Bible, they sound black in my head. So Peter's like, Jesus! Is that you? <laughs> Jesus who's also black in my head. It's like, Pity! I'm walking on the water! You know? It's just... It's what happens in my head, you know? And so they're talking, and, and, and I need you to get this, because Peter asked a pretty interesting question. Hey, Jesus, is that you? Yeah, it's me. Okay, if it's... Tell me. tell me to do something about the fact that it's you. I don't know if you've ever gotten hit with one of these, like, security questions on a website. They're the bane of my existence. First of all, I didn't know the answer to the security question when I made the security question. <laughs> Who is your grandmama's maiden name on your daddy's side? I don't know, you know? So I just, I just made something up. And so now, just because I'm in Tacoma, you know, and y'all should be happy that I had the right username and password. No, that's not enough for y'all. You need an additional verification. You need a security question. So they hit me with a security question. And, and, and isn't it funny how anytime I don't know the security question, I ask my, my, my wife. Because she's omniscient. You know, so <laughs> what's my dad's main name? Why would I know? I don't know. You know everything. That's why I married you, you know. I need you to get this. Any security question would have done the trick because all Peter's trying to do is verify the identity of Jesus. Any question would have done. Jesus, is that you? Yeah, it's me. What we eat for breakfast two days ago? <laughs> would have done just fine. But what the security question says reveals more about Peter than it reveals about Jesus. He says, Lord, if that's actually you, I've walked with you long enough to know this, that you are an empowering leader and you are not going to be content for me to spectate the miraculous. You are gonna force me to participate in the miraculous with you. So if it's you, go ahead and tell me to get out of my comfort zone, to get out of what's holding me back, to get out of my excuses, to get out of my generational curse, to get out of my bondage, to get out of my fear, to get out of my doubt, to get out of everything I've been stuck in and follow you in the miraculous work of the ministry. If it's you, get this, I'm not going to make you jump through hoops to prove that you are who you say you are. If it's you, I'm here to jump through some hoops. Come on, don't act like you ain't got no security questions. Lord, if it's you, bless me. Lord, if it's you, hook me up. I came to team church and now I think I gotta fire some people. If that's you, have them quit before I gotta fire them. But Peter knows Jesus well enough to know this. If it's him, then there's some work cut out for me. If that's who I think it is, if that's Jesus, then I have to say goodbye to a scenario that 11 other people are content to stay in. Because that's the real test of leadership. Okay, come on, come on. Not that the boat is broken, but that I've outgrown it. Okay, okay, okay. Oh boy, oh boy. Because there are some of us 
you'll only get out of a boat once the boat is broke. It's got to be a submersible. Oh, no, never mind. <laughs> too, too soon? Okay, never mind. It's got to be broken for you to ever get out of it. The proof that I need to get out of it is not that it's broken. It's that Jesus is calling me to something that's greater and different, and it may be unfamiliar, and it may be unpredictable, but I'm not going to stay in an environment that 11 other people want me to stay in. I'm not gonna reduce myself to be here with you. I know that, oh, I'm a water walker. There's something on me. See, my aunts and my uncles, they don't know why, 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 why don't you come to the family reunion? Because I don't wanna be in this boat with y'all. Everybody here is cursed with comparison. I don't wanna be in this. It's not that it's broke. It just don't fit me no more. It ain't that it's broke. It's that there's something on the inside of me that's calling me out of stuff that's complacent and, and average and mediocre. I don't want to be mediocre. There's greatness on the inside of me. And I hear his voice and there's an opportunity for me to do something I've never done. And so we get out of the boat. Come on, we've all at some point gotten out the boat. You start walking on water. This is crazy. It's a miracle. How am I walking on water? And then here's a real test of a leader. How do you handle failure? Oh, boy. Because nothing will prove your motives for getting out of the boat like ending up at the bottom of the sea. So Jesus now pulls Peter out of the water. We know that Peter has made it to Jesus because Jesus is there to what? Pull him out of the water. Now, this is where me and Jesus would have had some, some hands would have been thrown. Oh, sorry, for any of you who's not a millennial, that means we would have fought. Throwing hands, it means fighting. Anyway, urbandictionary.com, look it up later, okay. <laughs> because here's where Jesus says, you of little faith. Little faith? I just walked on water! Me and Jesus would have been over there on top of the water just fighting and I just would have sank again. Because his first words after I've walked on water are, you of little faith. Is there anybody in the room who you've walked on water, you built the building, you built the campus, you hired the people, you exceeded the projections, you did it, you brought revival to the city, and now you're on the other side, there's a sinking moment of failure, something didn't go right, you're in a season where things have taken a turn for the worse, and Jesus is looking at you and saying, you have little faith, and you feel disappointed, and you feel crushed, and you don't feel validated, because ooh, you thought that Jesus would give you a round of applause for all of the things that you did but Jesus looks at you and says I didn't see you do nothing but put one foot in front of the other I'm the one that made the ground solid before you you're not the miracle worker I'm the miracle worker all you did was show up and preach I'm the one that ministered to the room how dare we start taking credit for the water working wonder that we are, oh no, you are not that gifted. Please get over yourself. You had the faith to get out of the boat, but you don't have the gift to walk on water. So you get over here, here we go. And Pastor Kevin's right, I'm getting my doctorate right now. So you're about to get all this nerdy smoke. Because it doesn't make sense that Jesus says you have little faith unless maybe we're defining faith incorrectly. Maybe we define faith as how impressive the thing was. I walked on water. Maybe the Bible defines faith not as how impressive something is, but how long you can sustain faith. Faith isn't just belief. It's not just empty ambition. If, if that's the case, then 
we have the same kind of faith as the secularist. We have the same kind of faith as the entrepreneur. But, but my faith is not ambition. It's not rooted in an idea I got. It's rooted in a God that called me out of this and into something new, out of the familiar and into the unfamiliar. And so now Jesus says, you have little faith because Jesus doesn't measure faith by how impressive the thing was. He measures faith on could you sustain faith for 12 years while you suffered with an issue of blood? Could you sustain faith for decades while you wait for Sarah to get pregnant? Can you sustain faith for 120 years while you built a boat and nobody ever saw rain? Can you sustain faith for the long haul? Can you get in this thing and not because it's trendy, not because your friends is in it, not because it's cool right now, but can you last through a pandemic? Can you last through some hell and hot water? Are you the kind of person that's got faith like a flash in a pan or do you have the kind of faith that says I'm in this for the long haul. Now, give me the, the very next verse. Because this is the part that, 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 that I think is ridiculous. And when they climbed into, wait a minute. How'd they get back to the boat? I've heard a lot of sermons on the first time Peter walked in the water. I didn't come to preach to you about the first time Peter walked in the water. I came to preach to you about the second time Peter walked in the water. Because Jesus is not giving Peter a piggyback ride back to that boat. And there's no place where Jesus is waving that boat down saying, come on over here and get me and Peter. You know what's harder than getting out of the boat? getting out of the water and having faith again, hoping again, believing again, taking a risk again, building that church again, depositing into those volunteers again, recruiting team leads again. You want to know what's harder than getting out of the boat? It's walking back to the boat when you know what the worst case scenario can be. When you get out of the boat, that's just blind optimism. You just skip it along, nothing, nothing could happen. Then you fail and you sink. And the real test of leadership is not getting out of the boat. The real test of leadership is can you walk back to the boat after you've embarrassed yourself in front of the 11 jokers who told you not to get out of the boat in the first place? Can you hear Jesus saying, hey, it's time for the walk back. We're going to take a walk back. And there's a lot of us, there's a lot of churches that don't grow because they're stuck in tradition. But then there's churches that don't grow because the leader, he's not stuck in tradition. The leader's stuck in trauma. And whatever has happened over here is so traumatic that you've stuck with Jesus, but you're just not taking risks anymore. You're with Jesus but your faith is on cruise control. You stuck with Jesus, because you ain't leaving him. You love Jesus. And Jesus is like, okay, let's get back to the boat. And you're like, mm, no. Smooth no, nope. I've been leading this church for 25 years. We're just gonna ride it out into the sunset. No, we're not, good. We're, no, 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 we're, we're good. The next generation, oh, it's okay. No, no, no. I'm just, I just got five years left. I got 10 years left. And then I'll retire and it'll all be good. And Jesus goes, okay. Then that means that you were walking for you the whole time anyway. Because failure reveals your motives. If I was walking, for my own security to be built up, then I'll get over here and I'll fail and I'll stay here forever. Because there's a difference, uh-oh, between walking to Jesus and walking with Jesus. 
walking to Jesus is look what I can do. Are you going to clap for me? Because I got into ministry because my dad never, uh uh-oh. My dad didn't affirm me, so look what I can do. And now instead of ministry being your walk with him, ministry has become what you do for him and you're addicted to applause and you're addicted to approval because whatever negative, toxic issue you have not worked out in yourself. And it's easy to walk to Jesus, but it's very difficult to fail and deal with trauma and pain and disappointment and, and, and betrayal and then to finally decide I've walked to him enough. It's time to walk with him. I've got to do ministry in a different way. I don't want to perform for him. I want to partner with him. I want God to walk with me. I want this thing. I don't want to say like Saul, oh, you've taken the kingdom from me because I failed. I want to say like David, as long as I'm with you, if you moving, I'm moving. Don't leave me over here. Oh, no, no, no. If we're getting back to the boat, I'll follow your footsteps just like I followed your voice when I got out of the boat. Me and my wife, we walked through five years of infertility. Probably the most difficult five years of our life. Got, got, got married, and I thought, you know, I'm handsome. <laughs> Come on. Pastor Craig's first seat's confident, so <laughs> I'm handsome, you know what I'm saying? I'd say that even if I wasn't, so my wife, she cute. You know what the world needs? More black babies. So like, let's do this. Let's, we done practicing. Let's get in the game. Let's do this. Let's have some babies. Six months go by, no kids. A year goes by, no kids. Two years, no kids. We sit in front of a doctor who tells us we'll never get pregnant. We sit before medical professionals who give us all kinds of advice. You should adopt. You should do this. You should do that. I mean, having biological children was just not in our story. So God calls me out of my boat. 2019, December of 2019, I quit my job because that year we had done 70 speaking engagements while I was a full-time youth pastor. And we said, man, I think God's calling us out of this. Ain't it great how God will call you but not tell you? <laughs> like, hey, in two and a half months, Tom Hanks is going to get covid the NBA is going to shut down. Everybody's going to go home. <laughs> like, that would have been nice. Like, clearly he knew. Telling me would have been great. <laughs> Middle of March, we got hit with 35 cancellations from conferences and churches all over America. But in February, we emptied our savings account and paid $20,000 cash to do IVF, in vitro fertilization. And I had the best day and the worst day of my life back to back. It was the first time I felt like we were walking on water. This infertility thing had been kind of like a cloud over our head for five years. This was the first time that we were doing a procedure called IVF. We had finally found doctors with some faith. We flew all the way to Barbados, Barbados to do IVF. We had gotten the money to do it. I mean, it just felt like we were walking on water. Every time we went in for a checkup, all the numbers were great. Oh, yeah, the embryos are looking good, and this is looking great. Everything was a positive report. And then I remember flying home from Phoenix, Arizona. This is February of 2020. My wife's got balloons and she's got a positive pregnancy test and she tells me that we are pregnant for the first time in the best day and the worst day of my life happened pretty back to back oh I'm elated I'm on cloud nine we have just walked on water we have overcome the thing that has been hanging like a cloud over us and then we go into our first ultrasound and the nurse hooks up all the equipment and then tells us that there's no heartbeat. That the miracle that we fasted for, gave to, prayed about, had other people pray for, that we made public declarations of faith. We said stuff like, we're gonna get pregnant. When my wife gave me the announcement, I actually ran out, to the, out in the street. I told my neighbors, I told the mail lady, that probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> we now have to deal with the miscarriage. A couple of months go by, my wife says, I think we should try IVF again. I was like, do you think there's another $25,000 lying around? I was like, I haven't had a speaking engagement in months. 
we emptied our savings account the last time we did IVF. And my wife said these words, God brought us too far to leave us this far. The same God who got us here is the same God that's gonna get us there. Out of nowhere, a random check for $4,000 came in the mail. Another check for two grand came in the mail. Another check for $1,500 came in the mail. And at this point, I was like, I guess I got to do this thing. But in my heart, I didn't want to because I knew how it felt to have a miracle ripped out from under you. I understood the trauma and the risk associated with faith. Because when you get out of the boat, you're assuming nothing bad could ever happen. Then you sink and you are keenly aware. Churches get sued. Pastors lose their mind. People from other churches come to this church and they have lost their mind. This looked like a sure deal and it's not. And, and, and now my wife wants to do IVF and my words were never again. I'll never put myself at risk for feeling that kind of pain. Because you want to know what feels worse than infertility, getting pregnant, and then losing the baby. Thank God. After a while, I started to come around. We did IVF again. Is there a picture of my family anywhere? Is there a picture of my family? My son. My son just turned two years old last weekend. Because I refuse to stay right here. I refuse to stay at the moment of sinking. I refuse to stay at the moment of failure. I refuse to stay at the moment of the moral mistake or the thing I regret. This moment over here does not define me. I've got to get back to everything God has for me. And I don't believe in me. I believe in the God that walks with me. So we're going to put one foot in front of the other and we're going to believe again and try again and risk again and hope again and get our hopes up again and risk getting our feelings hurt again. We're going to disciple again. We're going to build teams again. We're going to hire people again. We're going to trust people again. We're going to believe for revival again. We're going to teach the truth again. We're going to do it with grace again. We are going to get the soil cured from the curse again. We're going to do it again. I know you're tired, but there's more in you. I know you think you've gotten to the end, but God's not done with you. Your latter will be greater than your former. There's more faith in you. There's more purpose in you. You got more in you. I get it. You sat down at the bench press, your trainer said, give me 10. You cranked out 10 and then they said, two more. I get it. This is not what you signed up for. Mentally, you prepared to get here. And now God is saying, are you gonna sulk in disappointment for the next season of ministry? Or are you gonna come to the reality that there is another leg to this trip that you are gonna have to do all this stuff again, but I'll be with you. And you'll learn stuff on this leg of the journey that you never learned by walking to me, but you'll learn it by walking with me. Oh, don't focus on anybody who's still in the boat. You have nothing to teach me. You, have no, you can't criticize me. At least I got out. I'd rather be soaking wet at the bottom of the ocean, but with an undeniable faith that God can do the miraculous, than stay in my comfort zone forever. I want to know who I'm preaching to. Come on, you've been stuck right here. You just, you've been right here with Jesus, but just on cruise control. And you're so gifted that all your leaders, they're cool with you like being mediocre. You're gifted enough to get up on stage and just fake it every week. You're, 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 you're gifted enough, but you're just not moving the organization forward, not taking risks, not doing anything scary, because trauma has got you stuck. 
Don't know what it is. Who is that for? Who is that for? Who is that for? You've been leading, but you've been right here. You've been leading, but you've just been stuck. God, I ask for a fresh wind for every leader with their hand raised. God, I ask that you would give us the energy and the faith and the vision to finish well. God, I ask that you would reveal to us there's more in you. Stop looking back at your glory days of ministry. Stop recounting all the things you used to do. God doesn't need your highlight reel from last year. God wants to do a new thing in your church and a new thing in your city. And we declare in this place that even though I'm on the water, I'm on a sure foundation because my faith is in the only one who can make the ground solid beneath my feet. Can we throw up our hands and can we sing this out? Come on, that I know that my house is built on you.